good morning. Let me just uh, read something to you here. Let me, let me just welcome you first. I want to read something I think is pretty cool. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here this morning, for following our new parking directions while SeaWorld is being constructed over here on this side. That's the first part of our building program, uh, Outdoor Fish Aquarium. But um, no, thank you so much for uh, cooperating with that. And by the way, many of those guys, well, all of them this morning that are serving um, are your deacons that are out there in the parking lot. So if you've ever wondered, does the church have deacons? What do those look like? That's what they look like. That's who they are. Uh, they are servants, ministers of the church, and they are here to, to love on you and support you. So say thank you. Would you mind just saying thank you to them this morning? And all our volunteers, uh, those you see, those you don't see, those on the other side of the wall right now managing goldfish and children and expectations, we are so thankful um, for all that they do. Well, I am super excited about this. Many of you maybe have saw it, but for those who maybe didn't for our online community, welcome, good morning. I am so excited about this shirt that just came out. Amen. This is the coolest thing. But to me, it's the back that's the most important. Um, I don't know if you've had time to read that, uh, but it says, listen, uh, listen, there's a way to step out of your comfort zone. Listen, there's a way to step through the challenge in front of you. Listen, there's a way to step into the victorious life you were made for. And I absolutely love that message. So when we were sort of designing this and we, we had just pulled the trigger on it, even I was like, okay, this, wow, right? And so, but I, I get this message from a former member, Miguel Diaz and his wife Greer. They've moved to California. And we had literally just finalized the detail on, on this shirt. And he's, he didn't know this, by the way. He says, hey, I wanted to reach out and tell you that I still think about y'all. And we are glad to have been a part of Waterstone uh, for the years we were in Orlando. I almost fell asleep watching church. Thanks, COVID. And all of a sudden, the thought that I needed a Pastor Ron saying, listen, 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 in my life popped into my head. He had no idea we were designing that shirt. And he actually put the three hand claps. And I thought, well, there you go. And so you guys have always picked on me about saying that. And we thought, well, let's just turn that little fun thing into a, into a statement. And so with that being said, I want you to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I want you to hear uh, the Old Testament version of listen, listen, listen. I'm also going to do something a little different. I know you were just seated, uh, but often when, when they would read this in the Old Testament times, they would actually stand. So I'm going to ask you if you're able and capable to grab the Word of God and stand at the reading of the Word of God, because this is what is called the Shema. This is called the Shema. And when you hear those words, hear, O Israel. And by the way, if, if, you, if you know anybody that's Jewish, we're sort of ending for them. Uh, I sort of keep in line with sort of Jewish festivals and so forth. This is the ending of Rosh Hashanah. And basically, that's their, good, that's their new year. It's, it's good year. And so if you want to say Shana or, or Happy New Year to someone that's Jewish, just say Shana Tava. That's all you got to say. Can you remember that? Just Shana Tava. It's really simple. And they'll probably start speaking back to you in either Yiddish or Hebrew. And you'll be like, that's as far as I can go, right? But um, anyway, hear, O Israel. Listen to this. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Does that explain some of the songs we sang this morning? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Can we just pray for just a moment? Heavenly Father, honor the reading of your word. We believe it is your word. So when you tell us, listen, when you call us to hear your word, Lord, may we do that. As Paul just expressed in leading in worship, may, may these not just be words that we sung. May these also not just be words we read on a page. But as we just heard, you have told us, hear, O Israel, hear, O Israel. These are your words. So, Father, may our heart receive what you have to say for us this morning. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for honoring the reading of the Word of God um, in that way, in that respectful way. More ceremonial, but hopefully the ceremonial just uh, sort of ignites a passion in your heart. So here we are this morning. The, the title of the message is Design on a Dime. Now, I'm actually going to preach two messages in one. 
um, this morning. And, and here's what I mean by that. So if you're here this morning and you have little ones, you still have children in your house. Of course, this message is like tailor-made just for you. But the reason why I go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 6 is a reminder that that Deuteronomy chapter 6 wasn't a children's sermon. Deuteronomy chapter 6 wasn't a children's message. Deuteronomy chapter 6 was, was aimed at every one of us who call ourselves followers of Christ. And these are the things we are supposed to do. So to, to maybe help you understand the application of that, when I make a point that is, is designed and tailored toward the family, I'm going to add to that so you can understand as a follower of Christ what that means to you. Because just because we're in a family sermon series, I don't want you to tune out and turn off. I don't want you to think, well, I don't have preschoolers, I don't have teenagers, some empty nester or grandparent, don't have any children. I don't want you to think that. You say, well, I'm not even married. I don't, I don't want you to tune in and turn off, tune out and turn off. Just because you hear that message, which is why I went back and read Deuteronomy chapter 6. It didn't say here, oh, parents. It didn't say here, mom and dads. It said here, oh, Israel, followers of Christ, if you will, New Testament version. Listen to what God's instructions are for you and I to follow him. So I want to make it very clear this morning as we're going through this. This isn't just a message and only a message just for those who have children. It's a message for all of us. So in other words, the, the, the whole thrust of this message, design on the dying, is what are some things you and I can do in our walk to see some immediate changes? Well, what are some simple things we can do that make significant adjustments? I hear comments like this quite frequently, obviously, in, in counseling and discussion and, and, and talks of folks like, help me pray through this and help me pray through this. And you know, they're, they're often like, I, I want to know how to change my attitude. I want to know how to, you know, adjust my marriage. I, I want Lord, the Lord to bless me. I want to be positioned in certain areas, financially, emotionally. Like, I, I want to make sure I'm in God's will. And often when we look at what's going on in their life, it's not significant changes that need to be made. Most often. Most often it's simple little adjustments. It's simple little changes. And we're going to look at those this morning that make significant changes in your life. And so no matter where you find yourself, parent or you're not a parent, this is for all of us. These instructions from the Word of God are, are going to guide us. So we're in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, and I want to read this to you this morning. It's a very familiar family passage. The Bible tells you and I in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, we know it. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So let me pull out a number of things about this before we get into it. Number one, it is a proverb. Um, a proverb is, is not a guarantee. I need you to understand that. A proverb is something that when generally applied, it generally works. Do you understand that? Meaning as a parent, right, at some point you realize early on, like early on in the life of, your, of, of being a parent and with your children, you learn that they have their own self-will. <laughs> you learn that some of them have even a stronger will than other children. Meaning that, that at some point you, you recognize that no matter what you tell them, like, don't, 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 don't you? Right? Have you ever used that voice? Like, don't you do that? They're going to look at you and go, oh, yeah? And they're going to do it anyway. You quickly realize they have their own will. So this is not a guarantee, right? So... The reason why I say that, there's a lot of families. And every time I preach a family sermon, there's, there's always a handful of families that come to me and just say, I've, I've failed. I don't think there's a parent in the room or, or watching or listening that doesn't feel that at some time they have absolutely not failed. I think we all feel that way. I think we've all said or done or not said or not done things that we wish we could go back and change. So let me just point this out. As we're working through this, this proverb, as it relates to children, it's, it's a proverb. When generally applied, it generally works. But I want, you, I want to point out a few other things as you're reading this. Go back to that verse. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. All right? So we're going to get into this a little bit, but I want to explain it now so you'll understand it when we arrive. Each child has their own specific bent, the Bible uses. That's the word that's sort of used in that. Each child has his or her own specific bent. If you were a woodworker, you would recognize this as each wood has its type of grain that you know how to work with. Um, even slicing chicken, right? you got to go with the grain or go against the grain depending upon, on how you want to slice it. So many applications here. But what the Bible means is you have to discover 
that child's bent. Now, let me relate that to you. If you're looking at yourself as the child and God is the father and he's instructing you, you need to know your bent. You need to know, if you will, your proclivities, your, your, your sort of natural tendencies of how you respond, how you receive, how you adjust, how you grow, how you listen. Uh, and, and so you need to understand yourself in that context. The Bible says that each child has a bent. As a parent, I am to study and sort of discover that bent. Basically said, each one of your children, if you have multiple children, each one is significantly different than the other. There are some things that when generally applied work, like, hey, don't step out into the street. You're, you're right. You'll get hit by a car. That that's, works for all children. But there are certain ways that you sort of bring that truth out to them and, the, and discovering their bent of what is God calling them to and how is God calling them? How is God shaping them? And you're even learning through the Word of God to discover your own personal bent. The Bible says, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Here's what we do know. What that means is the Word of God is like an amazing boomerang. The Word of God is like an amazing boomerang. You throw truth out there, and at some point, no matter what happens in your life, truth always comes back. Truth always comes back. Like right now, right now, full-on confession. Can we do this? We're not even to the invitation yet, but can we confess? And it's all right if you're not there. How many of you have reached the stage of life where you realize earlier on you said, oh, I will never be like my mom and dad, and now you're full-on like your mom and dad? <laughs> yep, exactly. Right? You're like, oh, I'll, I'll never. And, and you, you absolutely are doing that, right? Truth thrown out eventually comes back. That's the Word of God. Meaning, the Word of God does not return void, the Bible says. This is the reason why you need to know the Word of God and, and, and just shower them with the Word of God. Because the Word of God does stick. Meaning, at some point, at some point, they're going to wake up to either a truth or multiple levels of truth. Take my life for an example. I never thought I would go into ministry, and it wasn't until I was in ministry that I had the eyes to look back and see what my mom and dad did. And some, then all of a sudden, things began to make sense. That was truth thrown out. Now truth has come back. That's what this means. So keep all of that in mind as we work through this sermon um, this morning. How to design on a dime. Basically, when you look at your Christian life, you, you may look at it and go, there's, there's no way. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to get there. That's overwhelming. I don't know how I'm going to get to that level of obedience. I'm not sure how I can get to that level of trust. I, I'm not sure that God can even use someone like me. Like, really, God, are you calling me this and that? Like, the, the price tag may look too high. The task may look overwhelming. The whole goal here is to see this as design on a dime. Think renovation for just a moment. When you look at a room, a $35 can of paint makes a tremendous difference. You don't have to have picked out all new furniture and all new design and, and get the designer in your head and hire someone. Sometimes just the simplest changes make the most significant adjustments in your life. How to design on a dime. So I want to look at that. Here's, here's the premise of this. Simple suggestions that change your environment. Simple suggestions that change your environment. I love what Ann Ortland said about children. She said, children are like wet cement. Moldable and impressionable. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the challenge so you can begin thinking about it and visualizing this as we're working through the sermon. The challenge for all of us this week, especially if you have children, the challenge for, for all of us this week is to build something. Build something, whether it's another dessert, whether it's a, uh, whether you put their hands in cement, you know, and they make, build something with your children. Even if it's as simple as a paper airplane, the only catch is the person actually building it has to be blindfolded and the other person with them has to only use their words, only use their words to help them walk through that. So you're learning how, once again, last week's challenge, yes, was to make a dessert, right? Eat dessert first. That was sort of the, that was sort of the, the happy moment. Eat dessert first. The challenge was no matter what, whatever you're making in that dessert, build with your words, we're learning the power of words, which is why God said, hear, O Israel. Listen, listen, listen. That's the reason why God said that. Wake up and hear what I have to say. Because here's what we know. Children are impressionable. And you and I need to get the word of God in there. That's why in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it went from, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart. And oh, by the way, teach your children that. Show your children that. So let's talk about what I call the terrible tudes. The terrible tudes. This isn't, it's a sort of a play on words. 
It's, it's sort of a play on words for that moment when, when you hear folks say, well, I'm going through the terrible twos at this moment. The terrible twos don't have to be too terrible at all. Uh, they really don't. There, there's, there, I think we sort of misnamed that. Even that language, can I pause for just a moment? Even that language with your child in front of you, where you're saying, well, we're going through that terrible twos moment where I'm expecting them to destroy everything and just be, uh, be this and be that and be bad here and bad here and bad here. Of course, that kid's just going, all right, game on. You told me I, I, I'm bad. I'm going to be bad. Let's do this thing, right? And you're going, why did you do that? And the, if the kid could talk, the kid would go, well, that's who you said I was, Right? Right? Your words build. That's why we're focusing on building with your words. I almost, can I tell them this? Where's Raina? She's using my my safeguard. She's not in here. Oh man, we have no boundaries this morning. (laughs) We're in trouble. Right? I I almost pulled this lady over to the side in Publix the other day. Can I just confess that? I was in Publix and and I heard this lady on the other side literally like almost verbally abusing her son. And I heard him on the side and I'm like, all right, Ron, calm down. And she comes on my aisle, and I, and I intentionally just stare at something like, I don't know what I'm getting. I'm listening the whole time. And I mean, literally, like, like the kid would put the groceries in like this, and she would go, what are you doing? I said, put the groceries in like this. What are you thinking? I'm like, all right, remember you're a pastor. Like, you know, I mean, I, I almost pulled her over, and I was like, do you realize what you're doing to your child right now? One, it's just groceries. Like, he's literally just putting in a cereal box. He may have turned it this way, and you wanted to... And I, and I followed her, you know, as close as I could, and, and the Lord's like, nope, nope, just, you know. And I, and I thought, well, if I say something, that poor little kid might even get more abuse at home, so I'm just going to pray over her right now. That, yes, I, you have no idea how much your words... Be, we do, but for whatever reason we choose to. How many of you heard the statement, maybe third, fourth, fifth grade, sticks and stones... lie. Like right now, I can't remember a single stick or stone in my life, but I can remember a whole lot of words. Whoever made that up, man, they were wrong, right? So we understand this. So the terrible twos, what does this mean? So let me make, let me make the second point in the sermon. What is he trying to say here? You and I need to have the right attitude, have the right mindset. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, the Bible tells us we instructed in by by Paul in this writing, to have this mindset, have this attitude, which was in Christ Jesus. So you and I are literally taught to have the mindset of Christ, to think like Christ. In other words, use the word toward your children, use the words toward your spouse that Christ would use over you. I can't find anywhere in the scriptures where God tells you and I, I didn't love you from the beginning. Uh, I, when I looked at you, I saw you at your worst, and I couldn't believe that's who you were. I just knew that'd be who you were, and so I chose to walk away from you. I, I don't find those words. I find the opposite, that I have loved you with an everlasting love. Even before the foundations of the world were ever created, I have loved you. I find the opposite, that, that even while we were in sin, Christ still loved us. I find the opposite words, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. I find the opposite. So you and I need to have that right attitude, that right mindset. So that's the whole point. Attitude, and we know this. Can we just say this again? Attitude is caught, not taught. You can't teach attitude. Now, you do teach attitude, right, by the way you act and and, and the things that you say. But attitude is more caught than it is taught. So if you want those around you to act a certain way, maybe you need to start acting a certain way because literally you're a mirror of, of, what, of, of their reflection of how you want them to respond. So let's talk through this. Parents, for all of us, what do we need to do? Check your own attitude. Honestly, mom and dad, check your own attitude. And can we just be honest and confess that there are many days when our attitude is not what it needs to be. I mean, you, we have to be honest, right? Like... We've never parented before, and, and, and for many of us, you know, we've, we've never been married before. And so there's a lot of things that we've never really done. And no matter how many premarital classes we take or parenting classes we take, still you don't ever really know it until you're in it, until you do it. I did premarital counseling uh, two weeks ago, and I always loved this on the first session. And, and, and both of them were um, in the education field. Both of them were in the education field. Very highly degreed, very smart, very educated. And I said, man, with all your education, and I said, in all of the classes that you've had, how many of them were about relationships? 
And they froze and they went back and they thought and they were like, I haven't had one. Here they were in the education field knowing how to work with people and children, but not one class on relationships. That's the average for all of us. For most of us that have have gone on after high school, even college or even further, no matter what degree you're in, no matter what degree you're in, most people only maybe, maybe have one class, their entire educational experience on how to relate to people. And who are we around the most? People. So mom and dad, you need to learn how to check your own attitude. Here's where it comes to knowing your own bent, right? For those of us who are followers of Christ, you have to know your own heart. Know your own heart. Like, like know, know your heart's strengths. Know your heart's weaknesses. N- know environments that you, you should be in and know environments that you should not be in. Because remember, it's not so much us just telling our children what to do. No matter what we tell them to do, they're still going to watch what we do. You and I need to know our own attitude. We need to know our own heart. Number three, develop yourself. One of the best things you can do as a parent, one of the best things you can do as a follower of Christ is to develop yourself. And honestly, the older your children get when it, when it comes to parenting, just be upfront and honest and tell your kids, I've never been here before. Like, this is all new to me. Like, me seeing what you're going through now, even me sort of trying to predict what's happening right now in our family, we've never been here before. This is new territory. So I'm praying. I'm learning. And tell them, as I'm asking you to check your attitude, I'm checking mine. As I'm asking you to know your heart, I'm learning my heart. As I'm asking you to develop yourself, I'm developing myself. And here's the the last one you see it. Model the words and behaviors that you want. This is so simple. Model the words and behaviors that you want. Like, in other words, talk to your children. Talk to your spouse. As followers of Christ, talk to each other the way you want others to talk. Like, model that. Model the, the words and behaviors that you want to be around. For, for, for so many of us, we don't mind speaking vitriol, which is sort of very viciously attacking or highly critical. Many of us don't mind being extremely negative to others. We don't mind that at all. But, oh, you try to give it back to that person, right? And they're like, don't you talk to me like that. And you're like, whoa, wait, do the same rules not apply? Well, the reason why they're talking back to you that way is because that's probably what's coming out of you, right? So you and I need to to sort of check our attitude, know your heart, develop yourself, model the words and behaviors that you want seen out of your own Christian life and certainly in your own family. Here's why. This evaluation will change your child, but it will also change you. This is why you and I read the Word of God. We don't only read the Word of God to memorize Scripture. We don't only read the Word of God because we're Christians and that's what we should do. We don't only, The reason why we read the Word of God is because when we read the Word of God, the Word of God reads us. When we read the Word of God, the, the Word of God reframes our thinking. This is the only truth that we have. And the only way you and I know how to talk, the only way we know how to relate, the only way we know how to respond, the only way you and I know how to react, which are two different things. We're going to show that in just a moment. The only way you and I know how to function and live in life is getting this world view. If I don't have this worldview in me, then there's no way I'm going to know my attitude, know my heart. I'm not going to know how to develop myself. I'm not going to know what words and behaviors to speak and how to act. The Word of God gives me that, which is, again, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, when he says, Have this mindset in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ isn't just our model for salvation, Jesus Christ isn't just our model for sort of being a good human being. Jesus Christ is our Savior, our Messiah for a reason. Because it is Him, when we get Him in us, it is Him in us that begins to change everything about us. That's really what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian isn't that you have your fire insurance so when the end of your life comes, you can skip hell and go to heaven, right? That that's a byproduct. Getting Christ in me means without Christ, I am not what needs to be. There is nothing in me that is acceptable without Christ. There is nothing in me that is capable without Christ. There is nothing in me that that God will ever look down and go, wow, you kind of stand out among the rest of the crowd. You're separate over here. There's nothing. There's nothing about me. It's only Christ in me. 
which is why I have to have this mindset, this attitude, which was found in Christ. Mom and dad, let me be very parent specific here. Uh, There's a great book out by uh, Kevin Lehman. It's a little old, but it's still practical. It's how to have a new kid by Friday. How to change your child's attitude, behavior, and character in five days. Now, warning, before you read it, it's more about changing you than it is about changing your kid. Just going to give you a warning. So you're like, okay, I'm not going to buy that one, (laughs) right? But no, just three points out of that book. Number one, he says, let reality be the teacher. In, In other words, if we go back to what we looked at last week, you're wanting to teach your children choices and consequences, choices and consequences. Sometimes, right, you need to let them see reality, that there is a reality. As parents, depending upon the age, we want to guard their reality. For instance, let me be very ridiculous. You don't want to teach your children that there are hot things out there by letting them willingly put their hand on a stove. Like, oh, I'm going to let reality be the teacher. Pastor Ron said that. Here goes Johnny. No, you stop the kid from putting their hand on it, right? So you understand what I'm saying. But in most other decisions that where you can frame that and begin to teach that, let your children learn to fail as much as you hope that they succeed. Let, let them learn a failure. Let them be set up for that. If you maybe even set up a time when they can fail and you can sit down Deuteronomy chapter 6 and talk with them when they walk, when they talk, when you lie, when you sit down. That's when you can uh, walk them through that. That's what let reality be the teacher mean. Show them that based upon their choice, there's a consequence. You're going to live that the rest of your life, right? Let them learn that now. Number two, respond rather than react. Two different things here. Learn how to respond rather than react. Most of the time in our relationships, we react rather than respond. We do. That's all of us. We react. We react out of anger. We react out of anxiety. We we react out of fear. We react out of insecurity. And listen, there's not a mom and a dad in here that is not overreacted or or reacted too many times to things their kids have done. It's just right. We've just never been there before. But what you're learning to do is you're learning how to respond. You're learning how to walk them through that. So, for instance, this mom that was saying, you know, hey, you put the cereal box in like this, and I want you to put the box like this. What in the world are you doing, right? I'm just using that as a silly illustration. But what you can do is you can say, hey, well, let's let's pause for just a moment and think think this through. That's responding. Or maybe you do it later. Maybe you go, hey, remember when we did this and this happened? Yeah, I remember that. Well, let's walk through that for just a moment. That's responding rather than reacting because often we react and typically most reactions. Now, again, if the child's reaching for something hot, you don't say, let's talk about this while you're burning your flesh. You do need to react. You need to pull the hand back and go hot. Like, you know, you you get the point, right? I just got to make sure I'm super clear (laughs) on this. Let reality be the teacher but re- learn how to respond rather than react. And listen, don't skip the bases, is what he says. These are three tremendous points. In other words, you have to learn to, to take your child through the process. Hang on. If the Bible uses the term that your child has a specific bent, train up a way and they should go, you need to learn the grain of the wood of your child. And if you were trying to to, to carve something out of wood and you skipped some critical steps, the end result would not be what you wanted it to be. So you have to learn to take it step by step. I am the world's worst when it comes to projects like, oh, let's just get this done. I mean, I am and and, and not thinking through sometimes every little step. Like, I just want to get it done, especially if I don't know like what I'm doing. I'm like, oh, okay, right. Like, I'm probably a stereotypical guy, or maybe all of you, like, I typically don't read the instructions until it doesn't work, right? I'm like, well, I don't know where that is. You know, Raina tells the story all the time. Um, when we were first married and we bought some furniture and, and so forth, and it was Ikea type, and you had to put it together. And she comes in and she sees what I'm doing. Remember, my wife is the engineer. I'm not. She comes in and she just asks instead of states. She asks, like, are you sure the screw should go that way? And I'm like, heck Yeah. <laughs> And I flip over the TV console and I'd screw through the top. And so, well, um, I guess the screw wasn't supposed to go that way, right? And and so here's my point. Instead of reacting like, oh my gosh, you're going to destroy it. What are you doing? She just said, are you sure the screw should go that way? 
And the whole time she's telling me later, she's walking away going, oh, when he flips that thing over, he's going to find out the screw is sticking out when it wasn't supposed to do that. Don't skip the bases is my point. Discover the bent that your child has. And even if some steps are going to take longer than others, don't skip the bases. Three good points from his book. Here's the next one. Learn how to parent with the end in mind. You always have to parent with the end in mind. Now stop. Hang on. For most of us, if we play the stock market, or even if you have a financial mindset, we know how to do this in the stock market, but we just, for some reason, don't know how to do it with our children. So we know that 30 years from now, I would hope that my financial stability is at this point so that I'm able to live through the end of life in retirement, right? So we're really good in some things at looking to the very end and then sort of reverse management, like what's it going to take me to get there? You have to do the same thing with your children. Now that you sort of understand their bent, now you're asking, well, if this is their bent and and this is the maximum way that God can shape them, now that I'm looking from that view, now let me reverse manage that. What do I need to do to get them there? Because how many times as mom, mom and dad, parents, have we said, man, it just went by that One minute they're two-year-old, right? The next minute they're gone or they're getting married or they're in college or graduating high school. And you're like, how did that happen so fast? What does this mean for you and I? You see the point. You and I as followers of Christ need to learn to live with the end in mind. As followers of Christ, we can get so caught up in right now that we forget the long-term purpose of why we are here. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So let's back those verses up. Let's read them in reverse, right? I am to see God seated on the throne with Christ at his side. My eyes are on him, which allows me to run the race and easily identify the sin that prevents me from seeing the end game, knowing that there's a cloud of witnesses around me. That's how you reverse engineer. That's how you reverse manage. There are going to be days in your Christian life where you just want to give up. There are going to be days in your prayer life when you feel like they're no higher than the ceiling. There are going to be days when you read the Bible when you get absolutely nothing from it at what first what you thought. There are going to be days when you just feel like your devotional life has dried up and blown away. There are going to be days as mom and dad when you're like, I, I have been telling this same lesson, clean, make up your bed now for 12 years. I don't think my kid's ever going to make their bed, right? You just, you just, I just don't know that this will ever happen. But if you learn to see the end result, you see the end result and then manage it backwards then you can really look at it and say, okay, I've actually made progress. But if I'm stuck right here, if all I look at is right now, I feel like I'm going nowhere as a follower of Christ. But if I, if I look forward and say, well, I've come a long way, but man, this is where God wants me. I actually am making progress toward that end. You and I as followers of Christ need to live with the end in mind. As mom and dad, as husband and wife, parent with the end in mind. Here's what we mean. Visualize what your child, now watch. Visualize what your child can become in character, attitude, and behaviors, and then build toward that. The mistake so many of us make in marriage, in parenting, and even in the Christian life is training ourselves to to be at a destination rather than to be a person. We train our children, I want Johnny to be a little golfer. I want, I want Susie to be a, a, you know, a designer. I want Johnny to be what, right? I want him or... Like we, we, we pick out a destination for them. Like I want them to be successful in athletics. I want them to be this. I want them... Like, and that's fine. But we, we all only sort of fashion their life around that for that moment. And then we, look, we, we fail to realize that that season that they're in right now is just a season. The long term is when my child is married... 
and I want them to be in that marriage for 50 years, I want to be able to see my child at 85 years of age as a man or woman of godly character, of godly attitude and godly behavior, and yes, athletics and, and design and school and art, and all of that was used along the way. But if I only sort of parent, if I only sort of live for them to have a destination, I've totally missed the attitude, the character, and the behaviors that they should have. For instance... Lord willing, Rain and I are married a long time, right? If I'm going to be 85 and slobbering and she's got to live plus that, that's a long time. That's like 55 years or something, right? I don't know what it is, but anyway, it's a long time. Lord willing, we get to that point. My point is this. When I look at Raina and she's now in her 80s and she looks at me, if I look at her and I say, you are absolutely beautiful as the day that I first married you. Well, that sounds romantic, but in her mind, she actually knows, no, I'm not. I mean, because I really don't look like that girl, you know, right? I have a picture of Raina when she was in her gown, and I mean, that is her. When she's 85, she's still going to be beautiful. That's not what I'm... Please don't go tell Raina I said that that way. <laughs> don't interpret it that way. And Raina, if you're watching the broadcast afterwards, you will still be as pretty on that day. That's, she knows what I'm... But you know what I mean? So I have to learn how to learn, compliment her more about her character and her attitude, and her countenance with Christ, because when I say things like that, we both know we don't look the same way we did when we were 25, right? We get that. But what I see in you now is, is so much more. Uh, initially, I was just attracted to you for your beauty, but now I'm committed to you because of your character. That's where you want to get your children to. That's where you want your marriage to. That's how you want to see your Christian life. Live with the end in mind. Let me give you some words on how to do that. Diligent, diligence. The Bible says teach him. Deuteronomy chapter 6. The Bible says teach your children with all diligence. Discipline. Mom and dad, it, 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 you can't be an undisciplined parent and be a successful parent. Just like you can't be an undisciplined follower of Christ and be a successful follower of Christ. Because in the word discipline is the word disciple, right? And so right there is it hidden. Duty, like stay on it. Here's another one. Know their bent, know their being, and, and help them discover their belonging, their identity. And here's the next one. Make a connection. Make a connection with your children by making a connection to God. How? Reach out to God. How, do I, how am I a, fo a successful follower of Christ? Reach out to God. Acts chapter 17 Verse 27, the Bible tells, in him we live and move and have our being, right? That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way, I love this, and feel their way toward him and find him. Now, now go back and read this. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him. Do you ever feel like sometimes you're feeling your way toward God? That's accurate, right? And find him, yet he is actually not far from each of us. That is one of my favorite section of the scriptures right there. Is that Acts chapter 17, verse 27 and verse 28 and on. Make a connection. Why? Because parenting, parenting is so much more. It's more about relationships than it is rules. And Christianity is more about relationship than it is rules. Teach your children relationships. As we've already seen from an educational standpoint, they're not going to learn it. So where do they need to learn it? They're, learn, they're going to learn it from you. So what is the connection? The connection is unconditional love, which we get from God. Acceptance, which we get from God. And relationship, which we get from God. Do you understand that? Everything that you and I receive from God, we pass on to our children. Now, hang on. Everything you and I also don't receive from God, we pass on to our children. Your children will know your walk with Christ. They may not be able to form it. They may not be able to know how to phrase it. But they were made by God the Creator. They were made with this, this God-given ability to seek Him out. And they're looking for you to demonstrate that. They're going to know these things. How to connect. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's rattle these off really quick. Talk to them. This is so simple. There, there's so much power in talking to your kids. Dream with them. Sit with them. Say, I'm sorry. Offer hugs. Spend time. Here's the point. If you expect the best, you get the best. Each and every time. 
And, and, and by the way, build their basics of self-esteem. Here's the basics of self, self-esteem, the ABCs. Acceptance, belonging, and competence. That builds the self-esteem and identity of your children. And by the way, does that not build your own identity and self-esteem? By the way, if you had a husband or a wife or a friend or a relationship pouring those things into you, acceptance, belonging, and competence, wouldn't you feel? We receive that from God. So this is what you and I pass on. This is what we know. Consistency always wins when it comes to parenting. Consistency always wins when it comes to marriage. And consistency always wins when it comes to walking with Christ. We do not ask you to come to church and be involved in church. And listen, I love, love, love online ministry. I love our church online. It is vital. It is outreach. It is discipleship. It is ministry. But you cannot fully replace online with being in person. You can't, being in person cannot be replaced. There's something about coming to the local church. The reason why we ask you to come in person is not so we can go, look how many people we had. No, we understand it's a biblical principle that we were made for others and others were made for us. And my consistency in being involved only helps me live my life with the end in mind. So mom and dad, what do you do? Follower of Christ, what do you do? Respond consistently. If there's one thing children need the most of, it's consistency. Consistency. Follow through consistently. Love consistently. And expect consistently. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. You probably know this verse by heart. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not yet seen. Remember, expect great things, you get great things. Listen to the psalmist. Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. I love these verses. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Don't you love that about our Heavenly Father? How he sees us and how he knows us? Which is why he wants to Make a relationship, that connection to us, which is why he wants us to live with the end in mind, which is why he instructs us to have the right attitude. Proverbs 23, verse 24. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Love those verses. How is it that you and I can design on a dime? I'm telling you, these are such simple adjustments that make significant changes. So one of the things I loved and I was reminded by Jeremy in the back that at least when we would travel to Lake Mary, whenever I would say, listen, 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 Lake Mary knew to come out and get ready because I was about ready to leave. Well, we're there. All right. So listen, listen, listen. So here, here's what I'm saying. These are such simple adjustments that make significant changes. And it started to rain. If you want me to preach another 15 minutes till the rain passes, y'all can stay in here. I will. (laughs) Anyway. Right? These are such simple adjustments. Maybe you're here this morning honestly and you're just struggling in an area of your marriage. Maybe there's something you're struggling with personally. I don't know. Maybe you're here this morning and you absolutely feel like a failure as a father, a mother, Grandmother, grandfather, aunt, uncle, husband, wife. Maybe you just feel like God can't use you. You and I are going to get to those stuck moments every once in a while. So what do I do when I get in that moment? Have the right mindset. Lord, adjust my attitude. God, I know right now may be difficult, but here's what I see. I see that you've already called me. I will cross the finish line. And so right now I'm looking at that finish line, Hebrews chapter 12. I realize there's a great cloud of witnesses. I see you on the throne. My life may feel out of control, but you're still seated. You're still in the heavens. And God, I want to make a a connection with you. So Lord, I'm, I'm reaching out to you. And no matter what I feel right now, Father, I'm going to, I'm going to stay in this. I'm going to consistently read your word. I'm going to consistently come to you. I'm going to consistently seek you even when I don't understand it. Listen, coming to Christ is one of the hardest things and living for him is probably the next hardest thing. 
Being a follower of Christ is, is not for the faint of heart. Being a godly mom and dad is not for the faint of heart. Having a godly marriage and a godly family is not for the faint of heart. It will be the absolute hardest things you've ever done. Listen, the Christian life is absolutely, the, the, the marriage life is absolutely impossible. Being a mom and dad is absolutely impossible. That's why you and I need Christ. That's why we need Christ. And it's Him and Him alone. Looking to Christ, the author and finisher of my faith who for the joy set before him endured the work of the cross so that you and I might be able to come to him and say, God, I don't know what to do next, but I present myself to you. Can we do that? Again, this week's challenge is build something. One person's blindfolded, the other person instructs. Learn what it means to be a hands-on person that's actually building somebody's life. The better earthly father and earthly mother you are, the better you'll understand our heavenly father and how he builds you and I with his words. Can we pray over this? Father, we thank you. We rejoice in this. We come to you. One, because we can. We come to you because we should. We come to you because without you, we wouldn't have anywhere else to go. And the places that we would go without you are not places we should go. So we come to you because we can. We come to you because we should. And we're here this morning. Father, just build in our heart a desire to live for you. Reach out to us as you, as the scriptures have stated you already have. Help us to recognize your hand. And, and, and maybe in our moment of disbelief, maybe in our moment of, uh, of abandonment, uh, in uncertainty or insecurity, nonetheless, let us reach out to you this morning. For the family that feels like, I don't know what to do next. For the, the marriage that feels stuck. For the follower of Christ that feels dry and not sure what's next. Holy Spirit, do your work. Speak to the human heart. And help us to respond to that. We look to you this morning. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.